when I bring up testosterone replacement therapy for men, the question I get asked the most is about prostate cancer. Now, I've documented and discussed this in so much detail. I think I've probably done two, if not maybe three podcasts on the subject, including a dedicated AMA podcast on all things that relate to testosterone as far as risks and benefits. And um, I would say we've spent more time on this than, than just about anybody, perhaps not as much as you. Um, we came away from this analysis with the belief that there was no evidence that exogenous testosterone application was increasing the risk of prostate cancer. And there was actually some evidence that hypogonadism may not be increasing the incidence of um, prostate cancer, but may have increased the incidence of high grade yeah. prostate cancer. Uh, furthermore, we saw virtually no evidence that exogenous testosterone therapy was leading to an increase in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, though there was one study that suggested in the short run, i.e. within one year, highly susceptible men might see an increase in the risk of ASCVD, but that risk decreased at two and three years post-treatment. So uh, with that being my current state of understanding, can you fill in the gaps? Let's talk about it. This is a great topic. So so look, this, this thought that testosterone causes prostate cancer started in 1941, Huggins and Hodges, Nobel Prize, based on one patient. One patient in 1941, when they gave exogenous testosterone, the prostate cancer got worse. If you look at the different uh, paradigms, the American Urologic Association in 2018 came out with the testosterone guidelines, guideline on that under section, patients should be informed there's no association between testosterone and prostate cancer, strong recommendation. So finally, patients say, I Googled it, I heard I can get prostate cancer. So no, the guidelines are very clear. Based yep. on the evidence, no data to support it. Contrast that for a moment with the guidelines on estrogen therapy and breast cancer sure. in women, which we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole because sure. I get way too phosphorylated, but talk about the difference between men and women and how differently they're treated with respect to hormone sure. therapy. And yeah. I think a lot of that started with the WHI. The WHI, of course. 2003, so you get this big yep. uh, news and everyone's off hormones and later on you get a reevaluation of the WHI and say, hey, maybe we made some mistakes, yeah. but all that but noise- But the damage was done. Right, all yeah. that noise, it, so we're going to talk about the Traverse trial. So I've been one of the involved in the Traverse trial. The Traverse trial is coming out in June of this year. It'll be coming out at the endo meeting uh, about cardiovascular. But that was very similar. The, the impetus part of the Traverse was, hey, we have no large trial in men. We have, a, 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 you know, we have something. In women. We have women, nothing yeah. in men. The Traverse, six thousand patients, randomized placebo controlled trial, largest of its kind, will be coming out pretty soon. But I want to finish about the test, uh, prostate yep. cancer. So, so, so. Listen, so many, there's a paradigm shift and the paradigm shift is that maybe testosterone may not only be safe, but it may be protective against the development of prostate cancer. So I just want to give you an example. In 2015, the Hopkins group published a very interesting study on a concept called bipolar androgen therapy. They called it BAT. Who was the lead on this? Uh, it's Schweitzer and the, the uh, senior was Den Mead. Okay. Uh, and so in 2015, they did something very unconventional. You walk in with metastatic prostate cancer into Hopkins. Yep. And what they do is they give you high doses of testosterone to treat your metastatic prostate cancer. Which is mind boggling <laughs> because the standard care for that patient is the exact opposite. Right. It's to give you androgen deprivation. It's to chemically castrate right. you. Right. And the way they would do it, they would give you Lupron first to shut you down. And then they would give you high doses, 400 milligrams every month. And it would go up and down. And it would basically convert the castrate resistant prostate cancer to castrate it's sensitive. Yep. Right. And so, and so essentially the PSA went down by 50%. And what they saw was the radiographic disease, metastatic disease went down by 50%. That is unheard of to give that metastatic prostate cancer patient testosterone. The same group published numerous really impressive studies, but my favorite was the one that came out in uh, 2021 called the Transformer Trial. This is mind-blowing. So they took about 200 patients who had castrate-resistant metastatic prostate cancer. And they said, okay, it, and if they became resistant to abiodarone, the treatment of care is enzalutamide, which is an androgen receptor blocker. They said, instead of giving everyone enzalutamide, we're going to give half the men high doses of testosterone. Okay, so let's see what happens. So they gave them enzalutamide or high doses of testosterone. They found that the overall survival between the two groups was the same, 
no different. But the difference in quality of life? Was significantly yeah, better on the patients. Of got, course. But, but it got even more interesting. You were allowed to, if you took bipolar antigen therapy, you were allowed to switch over to enzalutamide if you became uh, resistant and vice versa. The patients who did bipolar antigen therapy and then did enzalutamide had significantly greater survival, 37 months versus 28 months, than enzalutamide, which is the standard of care. The cost of enzalutamide is 8,000 a month. The cost of 400 milligrams of testosterone is about 100 a month, right? And they had significantly greater survival. This and was quality published in 21. 21. So we're three year, two years after that. Yes. How many men with metastatic prostate cancer are receiving that care now? I, I think minuscule. Why? I don't know why. That's why I didn't. I don't know why attention was not given, more attention was given to this study. I mean, it was, it's called the transformer trial. It was really impressive, you know, as using a standard of care, which is enzalutamide versus bipolar energy therapy and then enzalutamide. So I think you're going to see a lot more of therapeutic use of testosterone. You know, um, I, I also, you're going to see a lot of studies. There's been some recent studies suggesting that giving testosterone to men after radical prostatectomy may be potentially protective against biochemical recurrence. That was Tom Allering's group. Look, I'll tell you what, so I have a lab. In my lab, we do a lot of basic science work with testosterone and prostate cancer. One of the studies we did was we took Petri dishes. We put Lincap cells, prostate cancer cells in those Petri dishes. And we gave each one of those Petri dishes different amounts of testosterone. And it is true, when you initially give testosterone, you see prostate cancer cell growth, no question. But when you give higher and higher doses of testosterone, you see greater and greater suppression of prostate cancer cell growth. We called that the inverted U, where maybe castrate may be protective, eugonadal protective, but hypogonadal is dangerous. So then we said, okay, let's do it in animals. 200 mice. Wow. We castrated 50 mice. We gave uh, castration, we gave 50 controls. We castrate and give low doses of testosterone, and then we give castrate and high doses of testosterone. These are pellets in the mice. We published both these articles. What we found was that if you castrate the mouse, you get a decrease in prostate cancer growth. No question. It helps. Yep. Low doses of testosterone, you start getting increase in prostate cancer growth. High dose, you get a statistically significant decrease in inverted use. So if I have prostate cancer- And the cancer, high dose compares how much to the uh, castration? Uh, essentially, it's a eugonadal range. Essentially, castr if, if you do- So castration behaves almost the same as- Slightly better, but in certain cases, in the animal case, yep. in the Petri dish, it was it's better, but it just varies. But the key is this. If I have- prostate cancer. Either castrate me or put me in the normal range, but do not, I think personally, put me in the hypogonadal range. I think it's the danger zone. Yeah, except I would say having watched men get castrated yeah. chemically, it's awful. I mean, I, I generally advise right. men to undergo surgery whenever possible. If surgery is an option, if you're that Gleason three plus three or three plus four or whatever, and and you know, it's just a question of having the best surgeon operate on you, Yes, there is a lot of downside of surgery, but I think it pales in comparison to the downside in, in what I see from men that undergo chemical castration. The metabolic syndrome yes. and the metabolic derangement that follows yeah. from being hypogonadal, beyond hypogonadal, yes. they're basically eugonadal. Um, not to mention the complications of bleeding that follow with the radiation. So um, again, I'm sure there's you know lots of medical oncologists and radio oncologists yes. that are listening to me now wanting to put yeah. arrows into the back of my head. Yeah. But uh, I don't think I'm speaking with just a surgeon's bias. I think sure. I'm speaking from watching men in the years that yeah. follow undergo complete metabolic destruction. Right. And even if they're still alive, they're quality of life is so poor. Sure. So that's why I would say like, gosh, if there's a medical way to do this with high dose testosterone. Yeah. You know, certain, you're right. Now certain patients do benefit better with radiation just based on Gleason score. And but yep. at the end of the day, yes, if it's moderate, we give them six months. If it's severe, we give them two years of androgen deprivation therapy. But we do in my practice treat men after radiation with testosterone. It's controversial. We'll get into this. And what dose are you using? Uh, Under a so, week? So typically I will use gel first because I, I want a short acting so I can stop it if the PSA. Then we'll move on to an injectable. But I treat them just like I normally would treat any other patient. I don't, whether they had- You the treat them to a level of total T or free T at the Within top the quartile. With, just like I would at someone in the normal therapeutic wow. range. But there's no data to support that it causes cancer. And what kind of consent form do these men sign to undergo something that is so radical? And do you need an IRB for this? 
So if you look, most clinicians or urologists, there was a recent survey looking at urologists, 96% of patient, uh, urologists will treat men after radical prostatectomy with testosterone. 86% of urologists- Yes, after radical. After yes. 86% after radiation therapy. Right now, look, there has to be some inf uh, consent here. There has to be some informed decision-making. The American Urologic Association made it very clear. The risk-benefit ratio after prostate cancer surgery or radiation is unknown. Right? Yep. We don't have the randomized placebo control trial. So I tell them, look, we don't have a randomized placebo control trial. These are the risks. These are the benefits. And we have a shared decision-making model. But there's something important. You have to understand something called the, the prostate saturation model. It's really important. We were taught in medical school that the higher the testosterone, the greater the PSA. We were taught it was linear. And the higher the testosterone, the yep. greater the growth. That is not true. At some point, it saturates. We did a study in 2011. We said the saturation was around 250 nanogram per deciliter. So if you take a guy who's That's at, pretty low. Pretty low, but that's where the sat inflection point was. And others have shown the same thing, roughly around 250, but we're all different. But why is that important? Because if you have a man who starts out with a testosterone level of 190 and you put him on testosterone- His PSA should go up. It should go up. If he's at 290 and you put him on testosterone, it should not go up. And if you take the guy from 290 and take him to 3000, should not go up because it's saturated, right? So it, it, it plateaus. Wow. So, so that's why if I give someone Lupron, that PSA, testosterone goes down, but the PSA goes down, yep. right? But if you raise the testosterone, it's not the more I raise it, the more the PSA goes up. So the tricky part for me is when patients come to me after radiation therapy, because they've been given androgen deprivation therapy, the testosterone's 50, yep. and they, their oncologist spent all this time taking away the testosterone. That's right. And when you get it from 50 past 250, you're going to see that rise until you hit right. saturation. And so the oncologist says, what are you doing? The patient says, what's going on? I have to set the expectation. Say, it's going to rise. It's going to plateau. I just have to have the understanding with you based on the saturation model. We just have to have this understanding. Yeah.